welcome to a special episode of A Flat Pack History of Sweden. Yes, hi. We're breaking the mould a bit and recording a special shorter episode this week. That will go in the gap between the previous episode and the next episode in the proper two-week timeline. Yeah, and it will take a jump forward in history as well. So this is a special episode that doesn't really fit in with the chronology of the overall discussion of Swedish history. We're doing this mainly to talk about something that we found in our apartment this week, yeah. which is very exciting and it's a whole story by itself. And also we have a new microphone or two new microphones, but we're just going to test the first one at the moment. So hopefully after the first Viking episode, we should have a mic each, a much better microphone as well. Yeah, and... we'll be sitting much more comfortably than we have so far when we're recording, and hopefully the sound quality should be better as well. So fingers crossed for all of that. Before we reveal what we're actually talking about, although you will know after clicking on the title of the episode, so it's not really a spoiler. It is a bit of a hint. But yeah, so we should start with the Swedish phrase of the week. Yes, so quite a long one this week, bear with me. The phrase is Mycket skrik for lite ull, som bonden sa när han klippte grisen. Yeah, that is a long one. Yeah, a lot of words there, and it's a funny one. So, translated to English, it becomes a lot of screaming for not a lot of wool, as the farmer said when he sheared the pig. Shearing a pig is obviously not something you do. So. No, you you shear a um, sheep. sheep. It's a, another word for shaving, essentially. But anyway, so it's a weird sentence. Pigs and wool and sheep and farmers. So obviously, if you try and shear a pig that doesn't have any wool, it's going to end up messy and the pig will scream a lot and you won't get any wool. So this phrase is used when you have put a lot of work and pain and hardship into something that in the end doesn't yield a very big result. Like for example, you can say uh, it was mycket skrik for lite ull som bonden sa när han klippte grisen when we prepared that presentation for work but in the end they didn't go with our proposal anyway. So a lot of hard work went into something that didn't yield any result. But you don't actually say that in real life, do you? Because it's too long. Yeah, so the phrase often gets abbreviated and you only say the first part. Mycket skrik for lite ull, a lot of screaming for not a lot of wool. Because the whole phrase is so long and everyone kind of knows it anyway. So if you just say the first bit, everyone gets the reference. Cool, that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm sure there is a phrase somewhere in English that is very similar to this, but I can't remember it off no, the top of my head. No, neither of us can think of an English phrase or you know expression that means the same thing. But if you can, or if you have a phrase in your native language that means this, why don't you tweet us or post on Facebook and we can collect phrases and expressions. Before we start talking about the content for today, we just wanted to give a bit of a news update, I guess. First of all, we were on the Amazing Presidencies podcast, hosted by the lovely Jerry. Yep, he goes through all the presidents chronologically, a bit like we do, spending many episodes looking at the lives of each American president. Mm -hmm. And he's now up to Jefferson, and I got to be Jefferson. Yeah, and I got to be a senator called Wilson Kerry Nicholas reading out letters yeah. to each other. So that was very fun. We'll talk a lot more about Jerry next week. He's going to do a great service to us by reading out a quite lengthy quote about the Viking Age. Yeah, so it's always nice to have some new voices and different voices on the podcast. So yeah, thank you, Jerry. I hope we can continue to collaborate. And we look forward to hearing more from you in a week's time. And we also played the promo for Neil's Assassinations podcast yeah. at the start of the last episode. I think he's going to play one of our promos on his podcast. So if you're a new listener because of that, welcome. You're in good hands. And also really exciting was the fact that we appeared for the first time as guests on another podcast. Yeah, the lovely Alina and Alex on the podcast History Hack invited us to talk about King Charles the Twelfth, or Karl the Twelfth, as he's known in Swedish, a king. Yep, from the sixteen hundred, late sixteen hundreds, and the early seventeen hundreds, they wanted to talk about him because Alex had heard a really crazy story about him getting drunk with a bear 
So if you want to listen to that, I think you really should. We spend about an hour skipping forward a thousand years in history to talk about this really cool king. We'll also give out a bit of a link to them, but they're just history hack, as in hack your computer. Mm -hmm. And they're on all the social medias and you can find their podcasts wherever. So yeah. that they should have loads of incredibly interesting and talented people apart from us or including us, come on their uh, podcasts. I really recommend you listen to them. Very varied subjects uh, throughout history and from around the world. And that episode came out on Monday, the 1st June, so a week ago now. Mm -hmm. So if you want to listen to us talking about something much further ahead in Swedish history, do go and check that out. But yeah, now on to the reason we thought we'd make this little special episode today. The story starts with the fact that we got a bit bored during the lockdown period. So we've both been doing a lot of housework in terms of reorganizing filing and boxes and things like that. And also found this really cool little old envelope in her box of Swedish things and took the item in question out. Yeah, so basically it all started with like about six months ago, I had some stuff shipped over to London, where we live, from uh, the south of Sweden, where my parents live. Stuff that was mine, but that had just stood in my parents' loft. At the time, I didn't really have time to go through it, so I just shoved it away in drawers and boxes. But now, during lockdown, I thought, oh, I'll actually uh, go through this. And in a little box where my mother had kept sort of old photographs and, you know, old passports and random bits and bobs that were mine from when I was a kid, I found this dog tag or identity tag and we'll post a photo of it on social media but I'm taking it out of its envelope now. So it's a metal chain with a metal little metal plate on it you know if you've ever seen a sort of a war movie yeah it is a dog tag it looks like a classic military dog tag that have been around for a long time so you have one despite never being in the military which is one of the best bits about this story yeah these are not military issued dog tags they are civilian issued dog tags and i had never heard of this from anywhere but apparently it was something that sweden did we'll put a photo of it on social media but basically this metal plate says on one side it has my personal details on it so in sweden we all have an identity number that's used for whatever when you apply for formal things with agencies and government authorities and whatever it's your date of birth plus four unique identity figures for you. I know in America, there's something called social security numbers. Here in the UK, we have something called a national insurance number that only applies for you when you work, but different countries have different systems for these. So it has my date of birth and identification number. And then it has my full name, town or village where I was born and a code that I had to look up and it basically identified which military district I belonged to where I was born. Uh, so that's on one side. Then on the other side it says personal, store it well, do not make note of your blood group on your own initiative. This can cause danger for your life. Yeah, because the idea is that all Swedish citizens born from the 60s until only 10 years ago, 2010, got sent these when they were born. And if there was a war, all civilians would wear dog tags as well as the military personnel. So you wouldn't just randomly put your blood group on it because you might get it wrong. And you have put, oh, I'm A positive. Oh, no, actually, you're A negative. And then you could get blood poisoning and presumably die? I don't know. I yeah. know. So this is its quite a mystery, all of this. So along with the dog tag, my mother had saved envelope it came in and it comes with some instructions and basically this says that I am meant to keep this nearby, keep it at hand and then like Chris said, in case of war uh, I meant to just put it on and wear it all the time 
And it also says that when you report for military duty, you're supposed to bring this, because this is the civilian version, I suppose, and you get it exchanged for a military one. It looks similar to a lot of other countries' dog tags in the sense that it has these two bits where you can snap it off in half. So if Orsa was to be killed in a war, you would be able to snap off the bottom part of the dog tag and take it to the military or civilian authorities to say, I'm really sorry, Orsa died. Here's her dog tags. Very, I don't, I'm, I'm getting a bit upset now. I don't like that so much sort of planning went into the you know, case of my death. But before we go any further with the story behind, like, why I have one of these dog tags, you've done some research on dog tags and these identity tags in general. Yeah, I, I just spent half an hour looking at it because it was interesting. So going back as far as the ancient Spartans, they had a phrase which was, come back with your shield or on it. And so that sort of meant a number of things in the sense that don't run away without your shield because it's worth a lot and the shield is a sign that you fought in the battle. But also the shields had deeply like personal and intricate designs on them. So you would be able to say, oh, look, that's obviously Leonidas's shield because it has a lion on it. But also they potentially engraved their own names on the back of the shield as well. So if you're going around a battlefield at the end and this guy's got no head, or no other identifying features left, you can see the shield and say, oh, sorry, Leonidas died, that's his shield. The Roman legionaries also carried these discs made of lead in a pouch around their neck, which were called signaculum. Hmm. Um, Is that where we get the word signature from? I have no idea. Ah. I, di I didn't go that far in researching the Seems name. Seems plausible. That's cool. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, Chinese soldiers had wooden dog tags tied around their waist during the revolt from 1851 to 1866. That was became a thing. And over in America, the first American troops to use dog tags were those of General George Meade of Gettysburg fame. Mm. He had his men write their name and unit designation on a piece of paper that was kept on their person. And then during the Civil War in general, some soldiers pinned paper notes with their home address on to, and stuck these to the back of their coats. And some stenciled their identification or their names into their backpacks or scratched it into their army belt buckle. So yeah. it's been going on for quite a while. Yeah. In America, they became sort of formalized in these aluminium dog tags that are you know, known in, throughout culture mm. in 1906. And by 1913, it became compulsory. The British Army, they used these slightly weirder circular ones tied together with string and things during the First World War. Then they came in in 1907. And of course, dog tags themselves, as also mentioned, that's not the real word. They're called identification mm -hmm. tags in the military literature and yeah. in the Swedish government advice. Yeah. But the word dog tag apparently comes from a number of different reasons. One was that the Prussian German army of 1870 around then, they called them dog tanks because it was similar to what each dog in Berlin had to wear around their necks. And there was also another story, which I'm not sure if it's entirely true, but I read about how when America was bringing in the social security numbers, US Army were the first people to take advantage of the social security number system and they included them on their dog tags. And oh. some politicians said, look, you're being controlled by the government. You're being treated like dogs by the government because you're having to wear this thing around your neck with your social security number on it. So it might come from there as well. Well, that is similar to the Swedish one then, because like I said, it has my sort of Swedish equivalent of a social security number. Yeah, that makes sense. And so there seems to be three different main designs now in the modern day of dog tags. Some countries have just one dog tag, like what also has, yeah. that can break in half in case of a fatality. Mine has sort of two grooves in it yeah. that makes it that you can snap the metal off. Some countries use just one dog tag that you just rip off, that you don't snap in half. Probably the majority from this long list I was looking through have two dog tags, one left on the body and one to be taken with you. And the only one that was a little bit different to the others was East Germany's army. They didn't wear them around their necks. They wore them, they just kept it in the back of their identity booklet. Mm -hmm. So they, they were the only ones that didn't seem to wear them around their neck. 
almost all of them have some sort of identity number, military identification number, name, and potentially like rank and things like that on it. But that's all, it's all very interesting. What you've been reading about, that has all been military issued dog tags. Yeah, as far as I can tell, I can't find any examples of countries giving out dog tags to their civilians before a war has even started. So Sweden's really <laughs> seems to be unique. Yeah, and that's why I find these dog tags fascinating. And I'd love to learn more about them because I've actually not been able to find that much information about them, which seems strange considering they must have issued millions of them uh, because I think it says so much about Sweden, about Swedish politics and foreign relations that we issued these military style dog tags to a civilian population for over 50 years. And I know you've been looking at a lot of the background. Yeah. That you, not, not the background of the dog tags, but of the general Swedish society. Yeah, the, I, I find the context of this fascinating. And we will no doubt cover it chronologically when we get to that point in the main narrative of our podcast. We just have some Vikings and the Dark Ages and everything else to cover first. But this is a little sidestep and a special episode. So... Sweden's often called, you know, the most peaceful country in the world, and Sweden tries to claim the record for longest peace, longest continual peace. Uh, we've not been at war since 1814, and I know when there was the 200th anniversary of that in 2014, big hurra was made around that. So we're an incredibly peaceful country, but we have also been incredibly militarized for a country our size. We had a conscript army from 1901 till 2010. I was the first year, so I'm born in 1991, the people my age were the first year that not all boys were drafted at the age of 18. That didn't mean that everyone did their military service, especially towards the end. Actually, quite few boys ended up doing military service, but everyone got a letter to say you were drafted and most men or young or boys went to be tested at these military facilities. I did as well, not because I particularly wanted to join the army, but because it was the first year that the draft was open equally for men and women. So I joined with some friends to like do it as a girl power thing. That's cool. Yeah. And just looking in my family history, my great grandfather ended up in prison because he dodged some of his military service. And I think being a conscientious objector is a very uh, noble thing in my uh, opinion. I don't know if my great grandfather kind of don't know what his ideology behind it was or if he just didn't want to do it. And as far as I'm aware, he didn't not do it for religious reasons or anything like that. It was one of those people who wanted to act independently. Which stay, up, think, stay on the farm. Which I think is a very noble thing to, to do as well. And there are lots of tragic stories about conscientious objectors uh, in Sweden, and some that had a really difficult time. But because we had this a conscript army, you know, a, for a country our size, at times quite a large armed forces, especially quite a large air force. I think at one point during the Cold War, the Swedish air force was the largest bar from the superpowers in Israel. So everyone had a re relationship with the armed forces. We have this phrase, Kronans kalsonger, the crown's underpants all worn the crown's underpants at some point wow. uh, and we can all relate to that so at once a incredibly peaceful country that is very militarized and i think to me nothing symbolizes this better than these dog tags so the fact that i as a civilian in a country that had not been at war for by then nearly 200 years was issued a dog tag in case of war. I think that perfectly 
sums up Sweden during the Cold War. Our position between the East and West and being non-aligned, we're not a member of NATO, for example, and balancing peace on one hand. We have a lot of our universities are really champions of peace studies as a subsection of international relations. But at the same time, we've all worn the crown's underpants. We all have a relationship with the military. And you said to me the other day that until, again, very recently, every month the air raid sirens were tested. Growing up in Sweden in the 90s and early 2000s, at three o'clock on the first Monday of every month, the air raid siren went off. And, you know, we're talking like World War II movie. Like, yeah. Kind of. That oh, it all happened once a month to test that they were still working. And we weren't actually ever... Well, we were bombed during World War II, but that was a couple of times accidentally. But you test the air raid sirens every month in a country that's not been to war for 200 years. You issue dog tags to all civilians in case of war. I think there are so many contradictions and maybe these dog tags, uh, they are the perfect symbol of that, a state of being prepared for a war that never happened. And to be honest, had it happened, especially during the Cold War, we might not have stood much of a chance Anyway, that's not me being defeatist. That's me being realistic about all out war in Europe during the Cold War would have meant not just for Sweden, but for countries in Europe anyway. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the Soviet Union's, their like reserve forces would have been eight times the size of anything Sweden had. Yeah. So. But at the same time, Sweden had this incredibly developed military forefront of many military military efforts it wasn't a russian conscript style army in the sense of just throw everything at a machine gun and walk at it it was high-tech jet fighter planes mm -hmm. and bofors weapons and missiles and everything so it wasn't yeah it, yeah it wasn't just oh let's put this token militarization of society a lot of money was spent on really good kit yeah and good training as well. And when we get to it, there is a lot to be said about Sweden during during the Cold War. But I think in the meantime, I'm going to put my dog tags back in the envelope. Do you want to help me? Yeah, let's shake them yeah. for, the, for the microphone. Uh. Putting it back in the envelope. I'm going to follow the instruction that's, you know, it's, it's funny as well because it's written in sort of very bureaucratic style Swedish on them. So I've put them back. I'm going to keep them safe uh, and store them nearby, as the instructions say. I'll put them back in, in the box I found them in. I don't ever want to wear them. I don't want anyone to ever have to wear dog tags, whether they're civilian or... Because in, in the end, they are worn to identify you in case you die. When all else is said and done, that's what happens in war. People die. That's the ultimate tragedy of it. So I'm putting it back and I'm keeping it as a reminder of a complex time in my country's recent history. And, and we want to hear your dog tag stories, especially if you are one of our Swedish listeners and didn't even realize you had these or you have it pinned up on your wall somewhere. I'm sure there's many different ways of We're, keeping them. Oh yeah, to all of our Swedish listeners, hey hey, it would be great to hear from you if, you know, like me, did you have you found yours in a drawer somewhere or did you not know about them at all or do you know some, some more about them? Uh, because like I said, there wasn't a huge amount of information available. Either way, whatever your dog tag story is, please get in touch. I'd love to find out more. And yeah, any other country, yeah. if you've still got dog tags, I don't know if they let you keep them. After you've left the military, yeah. do you? I don't know. No. I, I definitely know we have some listeners who served in the American military. So 
if you still have your dog tags, we'd love to see them. If yeah. you're allowed to do that, I don't know. And um, just yeah, just tell us your uh, your dog tag stories, the the history of them. Thank you so much for listening to this special episode that took us sort of away from the canon of what we're usually talking about and gave us a reason to test out our new microphone, talk about some other lovely podcasters and talk a little bit about these identity tags. So before we round off, we've had some lovely, lovely reviews from people and we wanted to read a few of them out. So in iTunes, they split them by countries. So in Sweden, there's a five-star review from Moose Experten, who says, very good concept and great hosts. The episodes could be much longer. They could, yes. They, could. <laughs> they are much longer. And then Chris cuts out a lot of the waffling that I do in between. <laughs> so the Moose Experten, I can send you the uncut version of these podcasts, which includes a lot of me talking about irrelevant things how warm it is in the flat for example yeah. <laughs> uh, so then over to america we have two five-star reviews one from skim tn great swedish history podcast the hosts are clearly knowledgeable about swedish history and are enjoyable to listen to i like the way the material is presented it's all very coherent and well thought out and of course the podcast is in english yes it is Thank you for that excellent review. That's yeah, very kind of you. Yeah, thank you. Much appreciated. And then we also have five-star review, De Lemke, username De Lemke, Swedish history in English. I've been waiting for an English language podcast on Swedish history. It's been fun listening. The hosts are awesome, smart, and engaging. Mm. That is an awesome review. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who leaves reviews everyone who you know, shares and retweets what we do on social media. It's amazing to see the number of listeners growing and, you know, it keeps us going. So, you know, thank you so much, really, from the bottom of our hearts. And we should also say thank you to the people who listen, who are perhaps closer to us in the sense that they know us personally, our friends, family. This isn't an Oscars I'm do I, I have been practicing this since I was 10 years old. Let me do the Oscar acceptance speech-ish type thing. No, in all seriousness, you guys know who you are. Our friends and family who support us in this. So thank you so much and tack så mycket to the Swedish-speaking audience. Yeah, but now we've done our Oscar acceptance speech, <laughs> um, it's going to be back to the real chronological yes. vikings next week not mm. two weeks time as this is coming out in a little extra bonus so yeah vikings next which i'm sure most people have been looking oh, i'm to. very excited i can't wait to you know raid northern england and pillage yeah right well see you then <laughs> bye 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 oh there's gonna be a lot of waffling there for you to cut out